media marketing are designed to you know capture these very deep limbic aspects of ourselves and they are so i i think um and social media the, is a great place for conversation, but it's not necessarily a great place for every kind of conversation. In the dark abyss of digital enslavement, Andrew Huberman emerges as a beacon of hope, revealing the treacherous web of the social media trap that ensnares us all, offering a lifeline to escape its clutches and reclaim our true identities. Scrolling social media. If you've ever scrolled social media and you're like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. It doesn't really feel that good. And I can remember a time where you'd see something that was just so cool, or you'd, you'd see something online. I remember this when TED Talks first came out. I was like, this is amazing. Mm. These are some, you know, at least some of them are really smart people sharing really cool insights. Brace yourself for a harrowing journey into the depths of the social media abyss as Huberman exposes its insidious grip on our minds, hearts, and souls, igniting a revolution of liberation and guiding us towards a life untethered from its suffocating embrace. Now think about an opposite situation. You go to the doctor's office and you're sitting in the doctor's lobby and you're waiting and you're waiting and there's no phone reception so you can't scroll Instagram. You're waiting and you're waiting. It's incredibly boring. It's a very low dopamine state. Amidst the virtual mirage of fabricated connections and hollow validation, Huberman unveils the stark reality of the social media trap, unraveling its devastating impact on our mental health, relationships and overall well-being, urging us to break free before it consumes us whole. Now, they may have clinically diagnosed attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but a lot of what people think is ADHD, it turns out, is people just over consuming dopamine from various sources. And then, and also the context within a, a TikTok feed is the context switch is insane. The brain has never seen, first of all, this is the first time in human evolution that we wrote with our thumbs, but that's a pretty benign shift. Prepare to confront the shadows that lurk behind the digital facade as Huberman shines a piercing light on the social media trap unmasking its deceptive allure and exposing the devastating toll it takes on our self-esteem, productivity, and genuine human connection. But it's almost as if you have to, the brain has to think that the person is gone in time and space. This has become much harder with social media, right? Because people can check up on people, they can hear from people in the old days, like when I was growing up, you just like took the phone off the hook or you, you diverted your attention into the heart of the social media labyrinth where facades are crafted and authenticity is sacrificed at the altar of likes and shares as Huberman's transformative insights empower us to break free from its seductive grasp and forge our own path to fulfillment. Just like in a classroom, there are certain rules, of course, of institution, but then you establish the etiquette within the context of the kind of class. You know, a class about personality psychology or the um, psychology of love, you're going to have a very different range of, of conversations than, uh, you know, a class on, um, you know, membrane physiology. So I, I think, um, and social also media the, is a great place for conversation, but it's not necessarily a great place for every kind of conversation. Brace yourself for a battle against the digital enslavement that holds us captive as Huberman fearlessly unveils the manipulative tactics and psychological chains that keep us scrolling endlessly, beckoning us to reclaim our time, attention, and sense of self. I love social media for the reason that you see the mo molecules in the memes. So it's like, get after it. You know, what do sharks do on Monday? Or I can't remember the specific yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. Or then they're the, like, sometimes it's just time to chill. Well, that's a different molecule. That's serotonin, right? And then dopamine is the get after it molecule. And epinephrine is effort. So if we were going to break this down really concrete, yes. we'd say adrenaline and epinephrine are about effort just effort with no subjective label on them, good or bad effort, whether or not stress or you're pursuing something you want to do. It's just, it's in exerting effort. Dopamine is about reward, but more so about motivation and pursuit of rewards. And then we'll get to it in a little bit, but serotonin is a different source of reward, but it comes from more relaxed states and it resets the whole system. And it's associated with things like sleep and gratitude and meditation and especially gratitude. One of the, I think, more um, toxic things in life is what's called, um, it, you know, evacuative projection. When people feel something and they try and evacuate it and project it onto somebody else. Projection is fascinating, right? Yeah. What you essentially just said is that you don't accept projections. And in, in fact, you transmute them to put in the language of the Buddhists, you know, you transmute it into positivity. And in that way, you, you, you truly neutralize it um, and transmute it. I think that if people were 
better understood when they were experiencing or observing evacuative projection, um, the world would be a much healthier and happier place. But it requires a certain a stable internal rudder. And, um, you know, when we're tired or sick or angry, you know, we, we, we're hungry, excessively hungry. Um, all of us are less less good at it. I've been positively struck by the nature of most of the um, interactions, not just feedback, but my favorite thing as an educator in the classroom, but also on social media, my absolute favorite thing is when the comments to, about other people's comments mm -hmm. are positively reinforcing. So you see people having conversations within the comments yeah. and you realize this is like if you, as an educator, again, you know, you, it's fun to teach and it's fun to talk to the students, but the real pleasure is in walking by a small group of students on campus and hearing them talking about the material. That's a, that just fills me with joy. And, and because what it means is that the ideas are reverberating in their nervous systems and will eventually wick out to others. So it's not just about feedback, it's about a venue for, for parsing information. I think it's clear that the level of autonomic arousal that's associated with emotions, either very high or very low, very happy or very sad, very anxious or very angry, clouds our judgment. It's very mm. clear. And I think the sooner we that give we- give them too much credence too. They're just feelings, man. Like we don't have to allow them to overtake us and monopolize everything that we do. They were designed to push us along certain behavioral paths, but they, they've grown in importance in the last few years. And, you know, we could get into a discussion about how, you know, social media marketing are designed to, you know, capture these very deep limbic aspects of ourselves. And they are. But what's amazing is, and important is that everybody has a forebrain. Uh, it, some people, mm -hmm. it seems there's more developed than others, but everybody has one. And we have this capacity for what we call top-down control, which is the ability to intervene in our own feeling states and our own action states and to set some some rigor and some, some real clear marks that we're out to achieve. And I think it's going to start with the, the generation that's very plastic right now. Yeah. You know, w most parents are afraid of stressing their kids because they don't want to, you know, again, I went to a high school where kids literally gun high school in the last 10 years, kids have, you know, there've been over a dozen, you know, train track. So those are kids that are committing for different reasons, but a lot of them is because they just feel too much pressure. Mm. So obviously we can't, you know, we can't pressure kids beyond their capacity to, to regulate. But the idea that all of our internal states should be driven by external things, that's, that's a foolish misstep also. So I think we need to operationalize what we're gonna teach the next generation. You know, maybe our generation isn't really rescuable, but maybe the next generation is. And if they understand that there's some concepts that sound a little mushy, like gratitude or mindfulness or these kinds of things, but as long as they understand that, for instance, gratitude, which we didn't really touch on, involves a whole other neurotransmitter reward system in the brain, the serotonin system, which buffers us against injury. It can improve wound repair. It can allow us to lean back into these high stress regimes. Learning and you know, kids learning how to toggle their nervous system back and forth between highly you know, duration path outcome focused states of trying to improve and learn, and then learning how to really relax and chill mm -hmm. out and enjoy and be socially connected because it will allow them to ratchet back in and focus with mm -hmm. extreme depth.